Okay. Uh, and now that that is all out of the way, uh, we can actually begin. Uh, this, so this will be a talk about the creation of the statue marker. So take it away. Thanks, Molly. Welcome, everyone. Some of you are joining us here on Zoom or watching live streaming to DC's MLK Library, or maybe you're catching a recording at a future time. It's so great to have you all here. My name is Rania Hassan. I'm an artist based in Washington, DC. We're here to talk about Marker today. Marker is my first public art sculpture installed a year ago at the intersection of Connecticut and K Street Northwest in downtown DC. This piece was commissioned by the Golden Triangle Bid and Smithsonian Women, American Women's History Initiative. They were looking, um, they were seeking one project to pay tribute to the women and to women and their history in our shared public spaces. Um, I'm going to start with an introduction to my work that brought me to making this piece. It'll also help explain the design evolution. Then I'll walk you through the different steps involved in how Marker was made. So I create large scale site specific installations about connections to time, place and circumstance. We all seek connection, whether it's how we connect to each other, people who've come before us or those we've yet to meet. My work is about interconnectedness and how our experiences shape and define us. The five main themes I work with embody ideas of time, memory, identity, synchronicity, and community. And my greatest inspiration is knitting itself. The thread represents our lives and all the different interpretations and paths we may follow. Through a single thread, we are all connected. My fiber art installations are all hand knit, made from one continuous line of thread. Threads carry memories and meanings, threads connect us. Metal isn't a new component in my work, but it's the first time it's the only material. In my large scale hand-knit installations, I work with super fine threads made of combinations of silks, linens, bamboo, intertwined with stainless steel and copper thread. Paths, the images that I've shown here, um, is this, these, are, these images are all from a series that I called Paths. This piece was Path 7. It was um, installed at the Smithsonian Arts and Industries building in 2019. Um, and it was suspended from a 40 foot tall ceiling um, and made of about 50,000 stitches with a base being um, a pile of gold leaf made of like 2000 sheets of gold leaf. And it was designed to like move as people interacted with the space. This next piece is titled Liminality. It's a site specific installation that was a tracing of the staircase of the Krieger Museum. Um, and it activated the stairwell for the very first time. And it's still currently on view at the museum if anyone wants to visit it. The connection points all converge to a central form that takes on the shape of a flat disc that's cut on one side and twists in opposite directions. Um, my studio work involves a lot of measurements and numbers and models to figure out how forms will scale up to fill the spaces they'll be installed in. Um, and these spaces are often much larger than my studio space. So for example, this piece is about three stories tall, but the, the whole knit piece would fit into my lap. And it consists of about 40,000 stitches right here. These images are from a series that I called Unravel. It's made, um, the exhibit was made of discarded elements of previous artworks and installations. Here, I drew details over and over again similar to how knitting involves patterns of the same stitch. And then I wove them together again to take on a new life. Um, the main theme of this ex exhibition as Unravel was, it was the idea of taking something apart to take a cl closer look at it and then put it back together again, similar to like how our memories change each time they were called. And then in looking back, we see things more clearly. Um, it was, or one of the quotes that I included in this exhibit was a Maggie Nelson quote from the book, The Argonauts, or Argonauts. Um, and the quote is, sometimes one has to know something many times over. Sometimes one forgets and then remembers and then forgets and then remembers and then forgets again. My work involves a lot of repetition. With this series, I started with an installation that combined knitting and painting. And then I made these drawings from the knitting and then I made paintings of the drawings. With this series, I also wanted to take a look, closer look at what I'd been making, how my work had been involving, 
and find ways to make it accessible again. When I started combining knitting and painting, my work was all um, 11 by 14 inches and they were made at that size so that I'd be able to mail them to people all over the world because I was very inspired by the knitting community that I'd found online. So now let's talk about marker. Marker, oh, well, this is, these are like all also from Unravel series. Okay, so marker. Marker is a monument to women's histories and contemporary experiences and the fibers that connect us, unraveling and knitting together at the same time. The title marker is a nod to knitting. In knitting, place markers are tools used for placement, for counting, to mark points, help fix things, or keep track of patterns. Commissioned by the Smithsonian Golden Triangle Business Improvement District, this bright pink sculpture was made of rolled plasma cut steel, and we installed it a year ago on Connecticut Avenue to help extend the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative into DC streets as one of the initiative's first public art installations. I came to Marker with extensive experience creating engaging large scale installations and was excited to expand on the materials I was using with my forms taking shape in metal. As my first outdoor public art piece, I assembled a team of professionals who had years of experience with metal fabrication and public art projects to bring it to life. And the shape of the sculpture was inspired by my Unravel series that I had just showed right before this. There were about seven parts to the process, design, cutting, rolling, welding, painting, installing, and lighting. I'll show you how this project came together. These images show different steps in the initial concept design process. Creating work for any space involves specific parameters that you have to work within. And being a piece that would be outdoors without the constant eyes of gallerists as the usual setting of my artwork, it would also need to pass a structural engineer's review. For this specific project, there was a maximum size. It would have to, um, it couldn't be climbable and there were lights, there were colors to avoid because of traffic rules and safety. Basically, it couldn't have lights on it that were yellow, red, or green. Um, I had a form in mind that I wanted the piece to take. It would be inspired by the Unra Unravel series where I had started with knitting and then I went to drawing and then to paintings. And then here I was going to drawings again and then translating the form into metal. I started with making models of what the piece might look like in 3D. Um, here's one of my earliest collaborators, my cat. There's just one, but she picked her twice. But this sort of shows like the different uh, things that I was working with, my different materials. I started with drawings and then I worked on models. And then here there's even that big pink form is an actual uh, scale size. So I could see what the, what size the form would take that was really helpful um, and also like it's it's great to make a model where i can see the different turn it, it would be like like as a 3d model i'm able to see what it looks like at all the different angles and i did this all as a hand cutting i wish i had a laser cutter at the time but i don't and i still need to get one but one thing so i started with this model and then with that model i took photographs and then um, photoshopped it into images of the site to get a better idea of what it would look like in place. So here's the model and this is what it looked like, would look like on site. So the first step of the process was to create a sample test piece because I had, um, I had no experience working in metal. We had to make sure that the idea would work. So we started with a panel that was like 1 16th the size of the final piece. This is the first piece that we made. Um, it's cut and then rolled and I've included myself here to give you an idea of scale. We were working, the plan was to work with four by eight sheets of metal that were gonna get plasma cut and then rolled. So this was showing the first part of the process. Similar to the sharing that happens in maker spaces, it's a this process is also something that heavily relies on shared knowledge. Color. Inspiration for color came from the Unravel series. The pink represented 
the most human form to me because I, like I say, often we're all pink inside. The inside was a darker color than the outside. And maybe the only thing that changed from the proposal to the actual finished piece was the line work that went from a darker color to the lighter to a lighter one in the final version. Test samples of the colors were made to help with color selection. And we took them to the site to see how they would interact with the lighting in the space. Another great part of this project and working with a golden triangle bid is that they have landscapers. So we got to meet with landscapers to figure out what colors we wanted to, to surround the piece. And they change out seasonally. So it's also fun to see the piece in the different seasons to see how it changes. Um, and being so big and pink and bright, I was sort of going for bright Miami vibe colors. And I wanted bright greens and different pinks to sort of complement the piece. Here is a detail of the final piece in place with the color. For fabrication, so I mentioned the structural engineer earlier. You work with a structural engineer to make sure that your plans are solid, that the piece would withstand weather and all the different elements of living in the middle of a traffic intersection. Wind, snow, earthquake, just all the different elements. Um, also, another issue or another consideration with public art is you have to make work that isn't going to be climbable or that no one can climb inside of. So um, there was a lot of thought that was put into the sizes of the different shapes. As you can see, the weave is sort of tighter at the bottom and then it's looser as it gets up tall. So um, the height of the piece was 15 feet. And um, this shows the overall layout of all the different panels that we designed to have cut out. So um, the first part was figuring out all the different spacing. Like I wanted to have a lot of air in the piece so that it would be lighter, but also you have to think about how much you could have and how much you could take out. And you didn't want to take out too much because it would make a weaker structure. So that was very important at the early stages. And then after the structural engineer signed off on the project, the next step was finalizing the design. So that's what we have over here. And the next step is getting the sheets plasma cut. This is a detail of this metal plasma cutter in progress. Um, they worked from vector files and it went from there to a metal roller. Here we have um, our fabricator Steve is checking the curve. When we had the metal cut, we also had these curve pieces made so that we'd be able to check the shape of the piece and make sure that the curve followed the right structure because um, the piece was going to be six feet, a uh, six foot cylinder that's 15 feet wide and to make sure that all the pieces connected together they had to follow the correct curve. The next step was welding. The whole piece was welded together. Um, here you can see it on site in Steve's studio. It's 15 feet tall and took up a good amount of the space there. Then the next step was priming the piece and then getting it ready for painting with the first layer. We'd um, initially, I had wanted to powder coat the piece, but as I was working on it, I found that doing the line work and then getting the different colored interior would be a more complicated process. And also the scale of the piece, you would have to find a powder coater who could take that whole um, shape and fit it inside of their space. And so that was also difficult. So we found that a better solution would be to use um, metal paint instead. So these show two different parts of the process. The first part was the priming and then on the right, it's the painting. And then from there, we also added in lines. If we had powder coated it, it would pretty much look like the um, image on the right. So here we are, um, these show images of the line work being added in. And then um, another part of the process is also when you're working, um, when you're being commissioned for something, 
there's like uh, regular progress reports or site visits. So the image on the right is us with Corinne Miller from the Golden Triangle bid, where she came to take a look at how the piece was coming along. And then we get to installation. A lot of different steps had to come together for installation day to run smoothly. Um, we installed in late October of last year. Um, besides weather, there were also permits, insurance, traffic plans for road closures, and a timeline that we needed to work within. It was supposed to install in May, but because of the pandemic, it was pushed to October. This meant that two big works that I had, um, that were supposed to be a couple of months and apart from me were installed at the same time. So Liminality at the Krieger Museum installed for a show called Traces that opened in September of 2020. And then this piece, which was supposed to install in May, ended up installing in October. Um, it was great going into the pandemic with two big projects in mind. So that was definitely um, a great part. Um, but there were also challenges then with like installing two big things at the same time. But it all ended up going very, very smoothly. So these are different shots of the install. Um, so install morning, I think we were on site at about 7 a.m. It involved someone driving the piece over. So it had to fit into this truck. And then it, we were met there with someone with a crane. So another part of the install team. Then there were also traffic controllers who were there to shut up, close off roads. We were working on a very specific timeline because with permits and things, you have to, um, you only have a specific time that you can work with then and you have to have it all done um, so that they can open up the roads again for traffic. Um, so yeah, so there was DC Department of Transportation. They needed like exact hours, how many lanes would be closed off, if it was one or two lanes. Um, and then we did this all on a Saturday morning, which was probably helpful so that it wasn't, there wouldn't be like normal business traffic that day. Cause this is like right downtown in DC in an area where there are a lot of businesses at Connecticut and Kate Street Northwest. These show the different stages of install. So the piece gets pulled out of the truck. There's the crane that helps drop it into place. There was also, um, we had to make sure that it was at the exact right angle that we wanted it to be at. So there was some maneuvering, um, turning it to make sure it fit exactly where the plan was. This is another angle of it in place. And of course, once it's on site, then there are, you've got to make sure that the details are correct. Um, so this, here we are um, making sure that all the painting looks good, catching all the parts that we may have missed in the studio. Um, and then another component of the project was lighting. We had to, um, my idea was that for in the daytime, there was plenty of ambient light. We didn't have to, it didn't need any special lighting. And then at night, there was also a lot of street lights, trap, you know, car lights. Um, and then that, so there's plenty of lighting to take care of it at night. And my um, plan was to have it glow on the inside. So I worked with a lighting designer to come up with a plan for how the lights would be inside, installed on the interior. Then I worked with an electrician to get them installed in the correct way. They're on timer they turn on, they're not on all the time, they just turn on at night. And then this shows you how the piece looks like. And then here is um, a shot on the right from installation day. And on the left, it's a um, image of one of the pictures from my proposal. So on the left is the model and on the right is the actual piece installed. Um, I thought that 
um, our team did a really great work in translating the piece to exactly what um, how we had envisioned it. We um, so yeah, so this is a this is like one of my favorite side by sides to see like oh you know this is our plan and then it actually came together and you can see here how the lines changed from darker lines to the light. Um, so like process working with different materials there was a similar work uh, process as well where when I'm working with um, my knitting in my studio and I'm working from plans and, and drawings and scales and I'm scaling up I also really don't have an idea of how it'll turn out until it's actually in place. So there's a similar um, process in this as well. And then here I am with the model and the final piece in place. And then on the left is an image with Steve Jones, my main fabricator that was taken on installation day. Um, we were both very happy that to have the piece up in place and installed. Um, and then the right, that's me with Corinne Miller from the Golden Triangle bid and Dorothy Moss from the Smithsonian. So this is Marker. Marker takes on this large curvy centrist form that looks like a crown or inverted dress, either unraveling or coming together and most definitely connected and very alive. This project was a way of expanding on the materials I was using and working with fabricators to realize my ideas um, beyond working from my studio knitting tens of thousands of stitches. And it looks like I finished really early. This is the end of my presentation. My goal was to give you an idea of where this work came from and also an idea of all the work that goes into making of a public art project. Molly, did you want to join and share any questions? Uh, yeah, um, just as a reminder, uh, it is now the question period. So if you have one, uh, feel free the excuse me, feel free to type them in either the Q and A or in chat. I will put a message right there. Uh, in, while we're waiting for people to write their questions, mm -hmm. um, I have I have a question. Is the title of the sculpture a kind of a pun on stitch marker? It absolutely is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was like my nod to knitting was to call it marker. And then also like it. Um, so the idea was that for the um, Smithsonian Women's History, History Initiative, like it was, it's a sculpture to um, to recognize like the work of women, even though, you know, men, of course, are also knitters. Um, but it was sort of like, um, rather than make it a monument about a single person, it was sort of more of a monument about like a bigger community. So, um, and then marker, I also like that the word marker also represents like a place marker. So it's, it's like a, it's like a beacon, it's a spot, it's a point. There's like so many different ways that the word marker can be interpreted as well. So yeah, it's absolutely about knitting. Um, can you talk a little more about what it took to um, apply to make this project happen? I believe you had to apply for a grant to make it occur. It was, it was, a, um, it was, there was a, uh, so the process was, um, the Golden Triangle bid put out a RFQ, so like a request for qualifications, and um, where you submitted like a certain number of images showing your work and then your resume and probably a letter of interest. Um, and then from there, they selected, I believe they selected five artists to put together a more formal um, proposal. So the model and the main drawings that I shared, um, I think just before the design in the design or concept section, those were all um, images that were created for that second main level proposal. And so then my work was um, selected from there to be the commissioned piece. 
Um, how long will the statue be there? Is it permanent? It's not permanent. It, it'll be rehomed um, early next year. So it was installed in October of 2020 and it will be removed by, I believe, May of 2022. So there's a, there's a little bit more time to see it. Do you know, um, do you know where it's gonna go when it's rehomed? Not yet, Not I'm yet. working on that. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's actually what, um, that's, that's like the next part of the process is finding a new home for it. So that's something that I'm working on right now. Yeah. Um, do you have, do you think there's a specific time of day when people should make an effort to see the statue? Like, does it look best in snow, in rain? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I would say any time of the day. Um, I like to, um, yeah, I like to like at night, it's, it's interesting to see it glowing. Um, then, but then in the daytime, um, I guess like with, as the seasons change, you have like the sun hitting it in different directions, but it is pretty cool to see how, um, how, how it's lit different ways. Um, the, I think I mentioned it as well. The, um, the inside is darker than the outside to give like an added layer of depth to it as well.